Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, today is the second day of Black Lives Matter Week of Action at SciArc. We are so excited to have everyone here today. Uh, my name is Alan Vio, and my team member is Baba Tunde Majidi. And he and I have worked since the summertime, basically, to organize this event. Um, we're super excited for today. We have moderator Mira Henry and John Cooper with guest Charles Davis II and Brian Lee Jr. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Bob Batunde. He's going to do a little quick overview of the rest of the week. Everybody. Um, so like Alan said, today's day two. Um, so today we'll be going from around now 10 p.m. Pacific time to 1. Um, and the same for uh, tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. A short recap and like um, kickback session uh, Friday morning at 11, and then we're going to finalize it um, with a really, really special Fridays at 5. Um, again, 5 p.m. Pacific time uh, on Friday. So join us for the rest of the week for like great content. And if you missed yesterday or if you don't have a, a chance to catch one of them, the same links that you clicked on today are going to contain um, the recordings of the sessions. So feel free to join us anytime. Um, that being said, if you guys are watching from the live stream, please feel free to ask questions through the chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring that and we can bring that up in the discussion. Um, pass it off now to Mira Henry. Good morning. Very good morning. Very excited about today. Um, thank you so much, Tunde and Alan, for organizing this. Um, thank you to all everybody who here is on this, this grid. Um, of course, so excited to have uh, Charles you here as well as Brian Brian Lee Jr. who will be joining us in a little bit in a little bit. Um, also, thank you Hernan for the support of this incredible event. Um, thank you to my um, friend and colleague John Cooper here. Um, uh, we will we are really looking forward to um, the the day. So I am going to do a couple of things here. This is this is my goal. So first, I want to. I first, I want to. You know that Tunde and and Alan have organized this, and they they have organized this each day in these sort of clusters of themes, and these themes based on um, what I understand is the Black Lives Matter um, uh, uh, school movement, a set of principles, and they had uh, thirteen principles, and I think it's important to just say them now, and I kind of also frame a little bit what the, what the theme is for the, for today. And it's a loose framework, loose theme. Um, but just to, to list these, because they I think they're powerful um, in the spirit of collectivity. I want to read these, um, these, these principles. Um, again, these are um, the guiding principles for the Black Lives Matter um, um, at school movement. Um, uh, the first is restorative justice, empathy, loving engagement, diversity, globalism, queer affirming, trans affirming, collective value, intergenerational, black families, black villages, unapologetically black, and black women. I think this is an incredible list um, and um, uh, incredible list of principles um, that really focus um, our set of values um, and I think usher in a sort of space of kind of serious um, generosity and joy and meaning. Um, today, we um, uh, the th sort of theme was brought together um, uh, of, of um, these three principles, um, collective value, diversity, and globalism. And um, the movement says these about the principles. Collective value, they say, we are guided by the fact all the, by the fact that all black lives matter, regardless of actual or perceived sexual identity, gender identity, gender expression, economic status, ability, disability, religious beliefs or disbeliefs, immigration status or location. The second, diversity. We are committed to acknowledging, respecting, and celebrating difference and our differences and commonalities. Um, and then globalism. Uh, we, are, we see ourselves as part of a global black family. And this really speaks to some things that came up yesterday um, that Chico Fatso brought up as well. Um, the sort of relationship to kind of black experience um, across different continents. Um, so we are ourselves, uh, see ourselves as part of a, a global black family. We are aware of the different ways we are impacted or privileged as black folk who exist in different parts of the world. 
Um, so the presentations and conversations that will unfold today um, are not tasked to respond to these principles directly, um, but I do want to acknowledge that these are our values, um, 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 uh, our sort of touch points, and we will potentially come back to these kind of dip in and out um, to the themes um, of those themes um, this morning. So our schedule for today is um, uh, I will be introducing our first speaker, Charles Davis II. Um, he will then present, followed by a discussion. I will then introduce you to our second speaker, Brian Lee Jr. Um, he will then present and a discussion will follow. Um, and um, we'll aim to, to close around 1230 or one. Um, I, I wanna say that uh, what I find the most remarkable about, about this event, um, first and foremost, is that is that this is a space um, uh, to car that we've carved out here. And thank you, Tunde and Alan, for organizing this, um, to, to share, to speak to, and to celebrate Black life. It's a very, um, it's very meaningful. Um, uh, um, of course, we have these two amazing human beings, uh, Charles and Brian, to come here um, to speak. I'm really excited to give them the floor and to really talk with them today. They do really important work, and I'm really excited that they're able to share today. The second, I think, remarkable thing about today is that at this event um, is um, to uh, um, that um, that this is um, that we um, sorry I'm, I'm sort of reading and speaking kind of freely and it's kind of getting a little tri tripped up, but I want to acknowledge that you know this is all founded on the Black Lives Matter movement um, and uh, and that um, Black Lives Matter movement was also just nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, which is incredible and everybody should know. <laughs> um, and the student organizing that surrounds this event, um, along, along with others nationwide, are testament to the positivity, strength and promise of these movements. So uh, well done and onwards. Um, Charles. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, for those of you who do not know, um, after this you will now know, Charles Davis II is an assistant professor of architectural history and criticism at the University of Buffalo. There he teaches design studios and courses in history and theory. His research examines the racial discourses of, the mar of modern architectural style debates and its long-term effects on the cultural biases of contemporary practice. His book, this beautiful book, Uh, if I weren't in my bedroom, I'd turn my, back, my background off. Um, uh, uh, on um, build, his uh, building character, the racial politics of modern architectural style traces the historical inter, intergeneration of ra intergenerations of race, um, um, sorry, integration of race um, and style theory um, um, in paradigms of architectural or organicism. Um, uh, uh, he's also the co-editor of Race and Modern Architecture, A Critical History from the Enlightenment to the Present. Also incredibly beautiful book here, which you cannot see, but I'm nonetheless holding up. Um, edited with Irene Chang and Mabel O. Wilson. Um, all along with these formidable books, um, also want to acknowledge the incredible essay he published in Long 42, Blackness in Practice towards, uh, toward um, an architectural phenomenal, sorry, Charles, toward an architectural phenomenology of blackness. Um, many of the SIAR community um, had the good fortune to take part in a three-day workshop Charles hosted last semester here at SIARC. So in many ways, we're welcoming him back and continuing the conversation that we had begun. Um, during that workshop, we were um, uh, really able to get into some of the core strategies of rethinking that his scholarship espouses. Um, quite central to this um, is the work um, to render visible, and I think he even says this in some point, render visible the politics of whiteness as a deeply pervasive and normative force in the discipline and practice. Um, it is always a special pleasure to listen to Charles speak and hear his um, evolving scholarship um, uh, and um, his uncompromising, I would say uncompromising project um, of what we would call perhaps flipping the script. So thank you for your work. We look forward to, to hearing you speak. Welcome, Charles. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Babatunde and Alan, for the invitation. Thank you, Hernan, for the support here um, so that this event can take place. Um, and I want to share with you guys just a brief presentation on some new things I'm thinking about in relationship to 
um, the theme, the overall theme. Uh, let me start by sharing the screen and then um, giving you a, a little sense of, of where I'm, where my mind is as we're, we're, we're um, engaging in this conversation. So during the course of um, editing the Race and Modern Architecture volume, I got a, an acute sense of a kind of tension that exists between certain forms of black activism in the American Academy, particularly within the Architectural Academy, and the broader discourses within the humanities on post-colonial criticism, particularly those that take um, both governing structures, but also institutional structures, including the, the academy, uh, to task for the ways that they promote racism, sometimes institutional forms of racism, other times uh, certain types of um, social and cultural forms of, of racism. And so I wanted to talk about what it is that seems to um, contribute to the sense of isolation of the black activist designer within the Architectural Academy. Um, and I want to discuss certain political myths and institutional structures that have unwittingly served as obstacles to promoting this kind of work. And that if we're serious about pushing this forward, uh, pushing an activist project forward, one that's aligned with the principles of Black Lives Matter in the way that were discussed earlier, then we'll need to, to address, uh, not only identify, but to address and redress uh, some of these, these issues. So uh, in my time here, I'm gonna talk about some of the myths that I see falsely separating the black activist architect from those who are engaged in freedom struggles around the world, particularly in post-colonial spaces, and a potential bridge that might bring these two realms together uh, so that we can actually cooperate and collaborate uh, instead of thinking in isolation of one another. So the first myth that I wanna really address is this bootstrap narrative of black progress, both in our nation and in our nation's history, but also in terms of um, the ways that we think about black genius and black creative talent in the field of architecture. Here are a couple of images that um, if you're interested at all in African-American architecture, you will, you will know and see. There are many now um, official archives, websites, um, popular history projects. Uh, these are all people who now are becoming sort of household names, whether they're Paul Revere Williams on the left uh, and his story of drawing upside down to stay out of the social space of white clients. There's Julian Francis Abel. Um, I know that the University of Pennsylvania's design school is establishing a, um, a scholarship in his name, um, and that there's a, there's a new uh, monograph on his work, uh, sort of recovering his contributions to the architectural firm that he contributed to um, by through direct visits to Europe and uh, bringing some of the principles that they call the Beaux Arts back into the United States, although not under his own name because he couldn't have his own firm. And then people like Werner Tandy, um, who uh, also uh, manipulated some of the elements of neoclassical architecture before uh, the black bourgeoisie uh, in the United States. Uh, what these narratives share, and it's interesting that they're typically of black men, black men architects, is that it's the sense that um, black men are just as good as white architects. All that they needed to do was to keep their heads down, to do a lot of work, uh, put forth a lot of effort, and therefore um, they will be rewarded by this. And, and the, the recognition that they're now getting is sort of a, a, for some, a fulfillment of this promise. It may have taken many years after their death, but now they're finally getting their, their, their due. <clears throat> We see this narrative continue into our professional organizations. When we think of the ACSA, and we think about the way that we measure talent and success, um, we usually do it numerically and statistically uh, in terms of how many people are licensed, how many people have received the highest honors and awards. Um, and uh, in this, this notion that meritocracy is the central value within the architectural profession, not um, social distinction, not personal networks of power, uh, not any form of racism, but it's really a meritocracy and that it just will take time uh, in the long journey of perfecting 
the experiment of American liberalism uh, that we will see um, what's happening with uh, black talent. And I think that this focus on statistics is actually a red herring. It's one of the things that prevents us from seeing what the, the substantive structural issues are in America, because it continues to reinforce some of the myths that I'm talking about now and some of the myths that I'll address later, uh, instead of exposing them as myths and moving beyond them to establish a firm ground, both institutionally within our profession, but also conceptually within our discipline to move forward. In order to do this, I think one of the things we have to tackle absolutely is this narrative of American exceptionalism, both at the scale of the entire country, the United States, but also within the Architectural Academy. And I wanna talk about what this means. So at the national level, um, this is founded on a belief that American racism is somehow different from everyone else's racism. Uh, and although you will have many studies that can describe to you what is particular and even peculiar about American racism, the one point that I wanna talk about is the distinction between the ways that we understand racism globally as sort of the remnants of and uh, the impacts of European colonialism versus how we understand it in the United States is completely different. And if we understood them as similar, we would be operating upon them differently within the Architectural Academy. So in this American story, and you can see in the image here, I've chosen uh, the Norman Rockwell painting purposefully um, because, <clears throat> and there are several scholars who talk about this, the optics of the civil rights movement. Who was given agency here? And who is deemed responsible for pushing forward our march toward freedom and democracy, toward an anti-racist future? In this image, this Norman Rockwell image, we have a, a young black girl. She's walking on her way to um, school. Uh, and this is clearly supposed to remind us of the time period in American history where we're trying to desegregate American schools and to allow for integration to occur. But who do we see here uh, uh, accompanying this young girl? Four faceless, but um, we're, uh, we're supposed to assume four good-natured white people. And always in this narrative of black progress, one must include the good white people in order to understand what American progress is. And so the image of blackness is always obscured by the image of whiteness and the goodness of whiteness and the acknowledgement of black humanity and the acknowledgement of black heroism and the acknowledgement of black genius cannot stand on its own terms, but is always relational to what it means to be a good white person in the United States. Very different from the story we tell globally when we talk about European colonialism and European racism, where we condemn the white people for being colonists, where we condemn them for being racists. And we say that uh, despite the infrastructural improvements uh, that were given to these spaces, that the logic of dominance central to colonialism is endemic to and problematic within European notions of governance. And so there's this two-sided story uh, instead of understanding the United States as a European diasporic country that also perpetuates some of the myths and patterns of European colonialism, we're to understand it as an exception. It is moving toward the perfectibility of uh, a liberal democratic experiment that is unique among the world and a guiding light towards freedom and meritocracy for everyone involved. And if we understand America in those terms, then blackness is forever tethered to whiteness and the goodness of whiteness. And in order to de define it on its own terms, it becomes much more difficult to do. So conceptually, we're in this bind now where we have to uh, understand blackness through the lens of whiteness in the, in the notion as classic as Du Bois's concept of double consciousness uh, in the way that Fanon talks about the, the uh, indistinguishability of black bourgeoisie within a kind of white colonial context, uh, all these things are, are at work. So then when we look at architecture and we look at the failings of architecture, the low license, licensure numbers, the low enrollments, 
the low retention rates, even social experiments like US public housing and its failure. Within this American myth of American exceptionalism, we are forced to say that this is just a momentary failure of our progressive liberal democracy. And we are forced to wait for the greater sense of perfection and tolerance that is going to happen within the United States. And so it's this insane level of optimism that we are forced to uh, entertain. Now imagine you're a black faculty within a school of architecture and you have to deal with and position yourself within this narrative. Um, it's very difficult then to critique the broader patterns of racism when what you're actually associated with, at least in belief, is a progressive liberal democratic experiment. We're moving toward perfection. You know, work along with the team, get involved or, or stop complaining because we're, we're moving towards something better. There's also the sense then in this notion of exceptionalism that the domestic story of the black architect, like I talked about before, uh, the bootstrap uh, story of the black architect is somehow unique and distinct. And we tell this story in many ways, sometimes institutionally. Uh, so uh, the uh, invention of the inauguration of critical race theory, for example, as starting up in and critiquing the United States uh, legal structure for the forms of embodied and embedded racism that it perpetuates institutionally through its very laws. Uh, the notion of possessive individualism adhering towards whiteness only within a legal code, um, uh, extinguishing the rights of native subjects and black subjects, uh, and then, uh, but even within that kind of legal argument, one can say that, well, all we really need is to perfect the legal system so that it includes the rights and privileges of people of color, thus the civil rights movement and why it factors so heavily within our, our narrative. And this writes out the narratives of colonial and post-colonial studies that give us a global sense of how these things were occurring. It also, um, if you think about the ways that we um, tend to celebrate uh, Black History Month and tend to celebrate the contributions of the civil rights movement, we lionize a particular view of Martin Luther King, the one who believes that the arc towards um, justice is long but, but uh, progressive and persistent, as opposed to the Martin Luther King who started to understand the the structural and institutional elements within American uh, politics and American culture that were bent permanently away from the rights and privileges of black Americans. Uh, there's, a, there's a weird kind of contrast, a binary between the peaceful attitude of Martin Luther King that we all must take no matter what level of uh, tragedy occurs within uh, the black community versus um, the milita militant status of um, Martin Luther King Jr., or not Martin Luther King Jr., of um, Malcolm X, or even Stokely Carmichael. And it's interesting, when you, when you listen to the words of Stokely Carmichael in the 1960s and 70s, he's already using terms like settler colonialism to describe America, because he understands that one needs to relate the freedom struggles of the global societies, the post-colonial spaces that were starting to emerge, and um, if we look at also the history of post-colonial studies, they're emerging from literal associations with people who are politically fighting for rights and privileges within these previous colonial spaces. He understands that the black struggle in the United States is exactly the same as that. And by demonizing Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X, we demonize the intellectual foundation upon which they understood America and tried to found any kind of uh, black activist tradition within the United States. And so within architecture, um, this results in a sole focus on rates of black licensure, a sole focus on black material cultural traditions within the United States, outside of a transnational understanding of this framework beyond the legacy of slavery. So we can acknowledge the sort of transatlantic slave trade as bringing people over forcibly, but then it's, it's sort of a, a, um, a narrative of um, forgiveness as blacks are slowly included and assimilated within the populace. This reinforces respectability politics. This reinforces um, the uh, kind of myths of meritocracy and other myths that um, prevent us from seeing the, the structural forces that are at work uh, within uh, the, the architectural academy. Now, if we think about uh, these, these kinds of ideas, I want us to then look at four, very briefly, four cases of blackness 
in the Architectural Academy, just to show how persistent these mythologies are. Even in what I would describe as really some of the most radical um, critiques and radical statements on what black activist architecture might look like in the United States. So uh, from people like Melvin Mitchell, uh, who's a fellow in the AIA, and his book, The Crisis of the African-American Architect, where he really isolates the culture of HBCU industrial academies uh, and the, um, the training that uh, these schools provide for a majority of licensed architects. And he's particularly interested in those who have graduated from HBCUs, moved to places like Washington, DC, and not only established their own firm, so independent practice, but they own uh, the kinds of resources directly that would allow for them to be contractors of some of their work. And he's, he's very dedicated to uh, improving the status of black housing uh, within the black community. And so this pattern of black ownership and this pattern of black entrepreneurship is what he's after. But even in his story, he is creating a contrast between the HBCU culture in the US and the uh, Ivy League predominantly white academic culture in the US. And this binary was one that was established by white architects in the 19th century in order to distinguish between the so-called vernacular works of uh, black and brown peoples in the US and the academic and intellectual works of those who would become professional architects. So in some ways, uh, this narrative continues to reinscribe the mythologies that I'm talking about here. Um, there's uh, the, uh, the primer Afrocentric architecture, uh, which takes African motifs, but translates them for a predominantly American US uh, designer base. And so um, this takes us back to a period in the 1960s, conflicting notions of what um, black Americans association with Africa is supposed to be. Is it supposed to be a kind of imagined motherland uh, where we reinvent what it, our cultural origins are in the same ways that European nationalism invented their own myths of, of uh, national origins? Or is it supposed to be a kind of uh, anthropological and very precise and scientific retelling of what that story is? And this, this tension was really emerging because we had, and we always have had, different forms of blackness coexisting in the United States. From those who came over here through the slave trade to waves and waves of immigrants coming to the United States on their own accord in order to establish their own cultures. All the way, dating all the way back to the, the Haitian uh, immigrants to the US who had left uh, the island of Haiti after the successful slave revolt against the French, coexisting alongside enslaved Africans in New Orleans. So from the 19th century on forward, we have had um, mutually distinctive and tense, uh, potentially conflicting forms of blackness operating in the US. Being able to distinguish them and to be able to talk about the differences is gonna be very important if you wanna establish an activist black practice because who does your activist black practice represent? Who is it that uh, is actually being um, spoken to? What's the community of, of folks that are involved? And so understanding the global nature of this uh, diaspora, I think is very important. And speaking about it with precision, we tend not to do that in the United States. We tend to homogenize our communities. African American, you all fit into one box. Asian American, you all fit into one box. And this again is a pattern of uh, the settler colonial thinking. If we look at Daryl Fields's um, book, Architecture in Black, now in second edition, uh, what's, what I find really interesting about Daryl's project is that, um, and he will say this, he says this in uh, lectures that he gives um, in some of the uh, interviews on his work, that within the uh, post-modernist architectural tradition in which he was trained, uh, where architecture is thought to be an autonomous field with its own uh, internal sense of, of its own history, not referring to the cultural and social uh, events and uh, expectations that are happening on the outside. So all the cultural richness that usually gives black art and black architecture its life is cut off in this, in this uh, sensibility of what architecture is. That in that space, he feels like an isolated black subject. And that he was forced to critique Hegel using uh, de Saussure and using um, Henry Louis Gates and using Cornell West to 
find the voice of black subjectivity that was still remaining within that uh, cut off and apolitical discourse in and of itself. But again, even though he's using the long history of um, uh, architectural style debates in the 19th century to talk about these, these ideas, he's still rooted in this kind of American discourse and talking about the sense of isolation that one feels within an American discourse. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Mario Gooden's very good book on dark space, which pushes us away from fetishizing the uh, visual motifs and turning blackness into an object in the same ways that the European tradition would have us do in a kind of monumentalizing style, much like what we would find in an Afrocentric architecture uh, discourse. Instead, to look at the particularities of space and the understanding of dark space. And uh, I like the title of his book for the, the potential that it opens up, although it doesn't really press on this as much. When you look at the, the title is Dark Space, Architecture, Representation, Black Identity. And that last term, black identity, mostly resides along the lines of African Americans in the US with a, a known history and legacy towards the slave trade and what that means in this space. So the existential angst that is associated with that particular black community. But black identity is much more broad and diasporic. And we know this from looking at the works of David Adje and his Pan-African narrative for the Smithsonian Museum, which was very different from the African-American narrative of the other competition entries. And so uh, the ability to think about and to move between the modalities of blackness that are suggested here is latent in these works, but they're still somewhat bounded by this kind of Americanist discourse that I'm talking about. And so uh, for me, I think that there's a necessity and perhaps even an opportunity for the black activist designers captured in this isolated space within the architectural academy to include the conceptual lens of settler colonialism and develop a settler colonial narrative for blackness so that these are not separate stories, so that we can tell the story together, the story of um, the legacies of slavery, the stories of the legacies of, of racist oppression that continue within the United States. Um, and that's sort of shown to you in the, the very striking uh, image on the left of portraits of powerful and supposedly uh, pluralist American politicians like Thomas Jefferson uh, being peeled away to reveal the, the hypocrisies, uh, the paradoxes involved in, in those notions. But also going, black, going back to um, a um, fundamental value of early black studies uh, movements in the US and recent settler colonial narratives in the US, which is to be really precise about who is the post in post-colonial studies in a US context. And if we think about that, then who constitutes the post-colony in our nation? If we think of it as a European diaspora that is a colony and that is on the trajectory towards a post-colony, then the only subjects who are really freed legally, socially, um, uh, and institutionally when America was founded and became an independent nation were the white European subjects, and particularly the white male subjects who owned property who could be thought of as citizens of the United States. Uh, and this brings into question then for me, uh, what, what does it mean then when the images of blackness are used and appropriated by European settler subjects in the US context to talk about utopian ideas? And this is just one, but there are many. Um, this is Stanley Tigerman's uh, post city or instant city um, where he's, um, trying to uh, think about uh, at a large scale what the implications of these kinds of industrial um, uh, infrastructures could be. And it's interesting that he uses the pyramid form here. For me, this fits into a long history of not only sort of cultural appropriation, but I would even say um, an even more interesting history of Egyptomania uh, in American culture where Egypt is brought in as a cipher to talk about some of the um, exotic uh, elements of American culture that one can't really name. And so uh, they're exoticized uh, in order to um, continue serving as this kind of 
um, sounding board for the inherent potential within American democracy. Not giving credit to black subjects or black creativity, not uh, even uh, bringing a prominent place for um, black modernities that were created within uh, American uh, modern and modernization and modernist period, but instead um, commodifying it and, and elevating it into a particular kind of, of cultural form, monumental form in the European tradition. However, if we think about this through the lens of settler colonial studies, who is still subject to the settler colony that is now established in the US, post-colony of Europe, but now settler colony within the United States, then the very, at the very least, just like in Show Harris's uh, essay, Whiteness as Property, we understand that America was founded on racial capitalism, that without the land of the Native Americans and the free labor of African slaves, America would not be a wealthy nation. Uh, and that the, the patterns that were established in this mode of being a settler colony were not only continued literally, if we think about Michelle Alexander's arguments about the new Jim Crow and the ways that we uh, strip black subjects of their rights by turning them into felons uh, and therefore turning the, the prison into the new uh, slave plantation, but also symbolically the ways that white subjects appropriate the identities of native subjects and black subjects and write it into their story as if they're trying to pluralize America while maintaining the institutional divisions between whiteness and blackness that keeps certain uh, figures privileged and certain figures wealthy and certain figures distinct and others continuing to uh, uh, bump their head against the wall of meritocracy, realizing that there's a glass ceiling that they, they cannot uh, push beyond. And so if we do this, if we introduce a lens of settler colonialism, I think at least two things happen. One is that the black activist work of African-Americans is now explicitly related to the conceptual tools of post-colonial studies and post-colonial scholars, both in the sense of um, that they already do, which is that they borrow certain rubrics certain intellectual frameworks, certain analytical lenses, uh, but now that can be acknowledged uh, as a kind of uh, intellectual debt within these spaces, which means that uh, if one wants to engage in a black activist architecture, then one has to be well-read in this literature. You have to understand what the relationship was between political uh, movements for post-colonies literally in the global South and the kinds of literatures that emerged within post-colonial studies. And what relevance that has for someone in a settler colony, where they're not in a post-colony situation, but continuing to fight against a colonial oppressor in that space. Now, if not only the black and brown subjects within the Architectural Academy can articulate this, but the deans and the chairs and the white liberal faculty that are on staff in these institutions, if they can articulate the United States as being a settler colony, not a perfect or progressive notion of American liberal democracy, moving towards perfection in the civil rights vein light as we understand Martin Luther King, then they will understand that the role of the architect is to both pick up on in the sense of Ariella Azule and what she's talking about as potential histories, the histories that were lost to time because we bought the American narrative of being an exceptionalist space but also projective histories, histories of the future where black people have agency. And this agency is built upon establishing a nation of their own, one that is separate from the uh, prerogatives of the settler colony and one that establishes its own sense of national identity. Uh, and in order to do this, we have to stop painting the black nationalist project as a kind of militant, anti-American project and understand it as one of the many modes of blackness that are necessary within a settler colonial space. And, and so I think that if that kind of premise is understood for every kind of uh, project that is created for a black community, whether it's something like as benign as a uh, public housing unit, like a Pruitt and Igo or a social housing space, or something that uh, feels uh, equally paternalistic if someone's going overseas uh, to a space that's uh, uh, need, in need of relief architecture, for example, or if you're just running a studio where your site happens to be for black and brown people, 
but you want to use the traditional mode of creating monumental architecture to address that problem. That understanding uh, the, the architectural institutions placed within a settler colony as legitimizing the hegemonic narrative, then you'd have to critique that position and you'd have to be able to work against that position in order to do something fruitful and meaningful in this black and brown space. And so what I'm arguing for here is a kind of intellectual precision and clarity that would then leverage itself into institutional opportunities. It would necessitate certain changes to the core curriculum. It would necessitate certain changes to how it is that we define who is the architect and what is architecture and what the political function of that architecture is. Not being apolitical or autonomous, but also not just being democratic in some kind of uh, post-colonial uh, inclusive sense that, that we can't um, uh, really leverage or prove with the, the historical facts in mind. So uh, that's sort of what's on my mind at the moment, just trying to build a bridge between the African-American activist, the black activist stuck in the architectural academy and this broader literature that seems to critique the patterns of colonialism that we can clearly see in America if we bring a certain lens to it and what the implications of that is for both bolstering that black activist position within the academy, but also for changing the, the general studio culture of architecture at large. Thank you very much for listening. I hope it made some sense. We'll see you within the discussion. Um, and thank you again for hosting this notion of, or this series of discussions on how we might be able to bring the principles of something like Black Lives Matter, a broad kind of social movement into architecture culture. Charles, thank you. Um, and uh, I always like the way you go straight in. Um, can you put that slide back up, the last one, though? Sure. Is this, um, is that Felicia Davis? Is that Manuel's work? Tell me, tell us so, about this work. So um, at the top image, top left, that's uh, Ola Lekan Jayufus's work mm. on Harlem. On the right is Amanda Williams's work um, mm, Amanda. from the Reconstructions exhibit that will be coming in, into MoMA. And then on the bottom left uh, is, a, is an image from the Hip Hop Architecture exhibit and it was held in New York. Um, and so for me, these are three different notions of black futures. Um, I think that they're, they're somewhat distinct in character, actually. Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. sort of all the same. Uh, and you know, I would, I'm looking for actually a really detailed conversation about what is a hip hop architecture? What does that really mean? Who is involved in that? Um, you know, what are the, the kind of spatial and material uh, patterns that are re reproduced? But I think that that's very different from um, Lake's an African uh, mm -hmm. in character, and even Amanda Williams's notion of what Black futures would be in the U.S. Have you been following their presentations? Um, I, I've well, been following the work of uh, Seku Cook and Michael mm -hmm. Ford, um, also of um, Craig Wilkins, um, who sort of loosely associated. There's some loose association. Yeah, yeah. Some, some generation, a little bit of a generational. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, for me, there's. There's an interesting argument by some that, um, and I think this is polemical, that uh, Le Corbusier is the grandfather of hip hop architecture, and I would just, you know, really heavily contest that notion at all um, through a settler colonial lens. I would say that, um, you know, if anything, um, you know, they were against the the notion of of a kind of hip hop anything producing anything architectural, um, which is testified to in Le Corbusier's suspicion that jazz was a very modernist practice, but that Blacks were not able to articulate what was modern mm -hmm. about it, uh, and that he needed to come in and rationalize it for the European viewer and turn it into something architectural. So um, the, the intellectual roots and, and sort of how they create that lineage, I think, um, still needs ironing out, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, development. You know, um, your, your reading today was so... Um... You know, it's such a structural critique, and um, you know, I was it was. I, I have a, I when I was watching the inauguration, um, as we all were, right? Um, it th this 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 feeling, this nausea came over me um, of the the reality that the kind of exceptionalism that was projected of, um, and here we have one of the most incredible poets speaking, um, our first, you know, 
black mixed race uh, 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 vice president being elected, women women being elected, and yet it's all the sort of nationalism and future thinking, and yet there was no actual acknowledgement in the entire ceremony of the fact that our land, this land, has been taken, and 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 it and it occurred to me how you know, how, how divided in some ways the, the sort of, um, the, in, in certain, in certain settings, in certain settings, how divided the, our, our, um, our, our capacity for, for seeing ourselves, right. That we can understand our own value, let's say the United States and our progress. So that was like a moment of progress, right? Here we are, you know, we got at, got Trump out here. We next thing, right. We got, you know, another black person in the, in the in black, some person number two in the, in the house. Right. And here it is. We couldn't even publicly acknowledge that the kind of violence um, that preceded the very sort of creation of this, you know, everything is, you know, Every, you know, our, our democracy, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and I, and I, and I saw that and I felt that and it hurt, you know, and I, um, and at the same time, I'm thinking about um, the space of academia and, and also um, worry also about uh, the, and maybe this is quite wrong, but worry about the, the kind of quickly allowing things to get too, um, macro for some for some for some uh, audiences such that it can somehow become even less their problem right um, now you can't that that doesn't do anything to undercut the critique but it does in practice and so I'm thinking in practice you know how you know how I, I guess I I, I um, I think the challenge to me is is how to think about this in practice, um, in dialogue, you know, in life when we're talking um, uh, with our colleagues. Um, you know, I I you know I've I, I did want to bring up this 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 piece, and I and I will get to a question, but I did want to bring up this piece that you and I have kind of talked about a little bit, but the Sahidia Hartman piece that she wrote this summer. You know, and where she and I'm going to read just a, a little snippet because it is deeply structural, as your critique is deeply structural, right? And there's a couple of things, I, and I knew you were going to talk a little bit about kind of global activism. I want to kind of get into that, but you know, she, you know, she writes um, um, because in many ways, I think when you speak, you start to speak the unspeakable, right? And then, and I think that this is one of your special gifts. Um, but uh, you know, she writes that. Um, she speaks in because this is an as this this is a is an interview kind of a, a constructed interview and she says um, uh, what we see now at this time right and thinking about what does it mean right now to be doing this work and asking these questions what we see now is a translation of black suffering into white pedagogy right in this extreme moment the casual violence that can result in a loss of life a police officer literally killing a black man with the weight of his knee on the other's neck becomes a flashpoint for a certain kind of white liberal conscious conscience like oh my god we're living in a racist order how can i find out more about this that question is a symptom it's a symptom of the structure that produced floyd's death right and she goes on and she says you know then there's the other set of demands Right. Educate me about the order in which we live. Here we are. Okay. Um, and, and, and she speaks about, she says many, many other things and um, about the kind of deep, deep, deeply complex situation. She says, this is crazy making. The largest loss of black property since the Great Depression was a consequence of the subprime mortgage crisis and proliferating acts of racist violence against um, occurred under a black president. It's all occurred under a black president. The largest incarcerated population in the world, the election of 2016 and the publicly avowed embrace of white supremacy with President number 45, all of these things we know, right? We know the racially exclusive character of white neighborhoods, how in urban centers, upper class people monopolize public resources to ensure their futures and their children's futures over and against other children, right? She says, it requires a radical divestment. It requires a, uh, the, the possessive investment in whiteness can't be re rectified by learning how to be more anti-racist. 
It requires a radical divestment in the project of whiteness and a redistribution of wealth and resources. It requires abolition, the abolition of the carceral world, the abolition of capitalism. What is required of, is a remaking of the social order and nothing short of that is going to make, is not going to make a difference, right? So this like, yes and boom, right? And I, and I wonder when you, as you speak, because when you speak, it is so, you know, radical in the sense that it is literally shaking to the core, I think, some of the questions, some of the various frameworks in which we kind of uh, 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 adhere to when we operate. Um, I wonder, um, you know, how, uh, I don't know, do you, do, do comments like things like structural, structural, uh, structural uh, critiques like that, that take it all the way to the level of capitalism and all the way to the like, deep cultural questions, is that something that you invite and that you also embrace the kind of in order to be able to really get through to the next level of radical thinking? Well, I think um, the, the quote that you read by Sudi Hartman is a good one for several reasons. And I'm gonna talk about two. Um, and I think, you know, if I, if I were to speak plainly about what I really wanted to say in this presentation, um, I think she says very poetically two things. One is that um, the problem with Black progress in America is that the black subject always has to be in pain, even though they forever aspire to be included, because then it gives white liberals the job of coming to their defense and doing something that seems to mix up things, but really changes nothing structurally about how America is run. And so uh, it's the same lesson that Franz Fanon is telling us that, you know, despite what people say, you know, black Algerian subjects are not equal within the French government. And they can't be because if we were to actually include them and to fully accept their humanity, then we'd have to give them full agency to govern themselves, which then, um, you know, leaves the black subject out of the mode, which I think is clearly the mode in architecture of proving the humanity and morality of white liberalism. That's why black subjects are there. That's why we have the bootstrap narrative. So we can say that, see, look at how good we are. We've included these people into our narrative of, of genius. Um, whereas if they had full agency and could speak for themselves and didn't have to speak through European idioms and languages, they probably would say something pretty damning about white liberals, just like they would say about white conservatives because they both are invested in this notion of progressive um, history. You know, the conservative bases is, is, they're just further along in saying that, well, racism is over, as opposed to white liberals who say that racism is still with us, but none of them are willing to admit officially that this land is taken from Native Americans. Now, Obama did say it on several occasions, uh, and he got flack for that. And when he wasn't um, chastising black Americans to be uh, morally upright and respectable, he got flack for that as well. Um, so. All, all of these subjects, black subjects at the height of American empire are not allowed to truly be black. They have to reinforce the narratives of whiteness that are about the positives of colonialism, in this case, settler colonialism. And that's always been their job. Show us that despite our colonialism, we can uh, show that you have progress, that you, you um, continue to progress. If the black subject was given full agency, the fear is that not only would they reject this notion, but they would replace it with something else, with something that was very productive and productive primarily for black and brown subjects. But I think that that's when you know that black nationalism is working. It's working for its subjects in the same ways that, that a kind of white cultural nationalism is working for its subjects, not in this kind of tokenist uh, manner, but in this manner that is explicitly for that particular community. And so um, when Sadia Hartman says that we must fully divest ourselves from white supremacy, from racial capitalism, I think she's not only you know, just talking about it in this kind of structural sense, but I think also in an intellectual sense. Like that doesn't have to be the limit of your imagination. That's not what's required. Um, for you to build a kind of productive black material culture. And I think, I think that many black architects are frozen in that space. They're so busy making something that would be approved by white liberals as well as black subjects that they can't speak 
the language that they need to speak to serve their own people. Uh, and I think that it, it requires a kind of either a radical stance by architecture schools to say that we are opposed to white supremacy in the United States. And to really understand what that means, which means that you can't like have studios where the neoliberal notion of progress and greening the ghetto and just dealing with uh, you know, technological progress and tokenized notion of sustainability are going to be sufficient. You have to deal with white supremacy at its foundations. That everything, every form of technological progress, every form of economic progress is a maintenance of white supremacy. And I don't think we're at that level of transparency or critique. And it's why I've always like tried to, to um, you know, be the wolf in sheep's clothing of being the reformist who at heart wants to promote a black nationalist project. Uh, because you, it's really hard to get in through the door of architecture, which is still very Eurocentric and still very much in belief of these notions of meritocracy, of these notions of, of fairness. Um, and to, to say, you know, you're, you're my real problem, right? Like it's not the like conservatives, it's not the, um, you know, two thirds of the country that doesn't vote. It, it's the people in power who believe they're very good white liberals and who don't understand that you're also maintaining white supremacy, even though intellectually you think you're opposed to it because structurally you've been made concomitant to what that is. So the way that we raise money, the way that professional schools are structured, the way that it takes uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars to make any kind of you know, noteworthy monumental architectural project, all of that makes us complicit. And this is like old, this is from like Marxist critiques of postmodernism in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but going even beyond that, you know, to say that in order to even have the possibility of building a black architecture, and this is where I ironically agree with Daryl Fields, like not based necessarily on the premise of keeping it constrained within autonomy, but even within this kind of settler colonial critique of the architectural academy in the US. There is no such thing as a black architecture. The architecture that we've seen produced has been produced to reinforce the meritocratic narratives of white supremacy, to reinforce the notion that we're living in a fair, exceptional project that is you know, leading toward a kind of perfect liberal democracy, which you know, most critical race theorists will tell you is not true. I mean, like just structurally, what we have continues to reproduce the cycles of poverty and oppression. For If it's not gonna be a black person in the future, it'll be somebody else who is the under, you know, permanent underclass within this country to, to both be the subject always in pain that we respond to, to prove that we're good moral subjects, building a better democracy. And so I think like, uh, you know, I'm looking for an architecture school that can break that cycle by giving black and brown people the space to build their own future. But that requires, a, you know, it's a risk, you know, it's a very radical project. And it's one that foregrounds everybody's concomitant um, relationship to white cultural nationalism, to racial capitalism, to uh, the settler colonial state. And I don't think a lot of white liberals are ready to hear this. And I think that's really you know, our, our problem. It's a, it is the problem of Martin Luther King trying to, to change hearts and minds, but I don't know that that strategy is the one that, that will work. You know, the you you're talking about a kind. I like that that you started with this idea of of the the black like idea of protest, right? And this idea of protest, and what you're talking about though, is a pro uh, like a life protest, like something that's durational, right? Not necessarily a protest in go in the streets and protest a sort of moment in time, but a sort of way in which we can understand protest as um, something that is ongoing. And, um, and embedded in, as you describe, yes, psych psychically, you know, spiritually, emotionally in the work that you show up to do every day. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder whether or not the sort of turn towards like tr imagining an institution that would ever support that is like simply not like, is it an institution that, we're, that we would be looking for to help support this or something really like this, that, that to me as a, I mean, 
is that even the right direction? Is it like a, at, at that point? Or are we at that point trying to say, okay, we're just actually trying to get our feet moving forward when we start to turn to the kind of systems that we understand and, are, and, are, and, and get paid by, I wonder. Mm -hmm. but to me, that's an interesting question because it, it um, reminds me of some of the debates around what it meant to have a black aesthetic. And when, when we had the, um, the projects of Amir Baraka um, and uh, the kind of artistic or aesthetic wing of the Black Panther Party movement uh, and Black nationalist movement in the United States. And their argument was that, um, you know, we don't view aesthetics in this kind of apolitical disinterested way that Europeans do. So when they critique us for being too political, uh, all we can say is that we have to be political because we're still colonial subjects within America. We are not free. Like you're free. You can do whatever you want. You can sit back and like have your nice disinterested aesthetic conversation on how beautiful that building is and talk about its geometrical proportions, all Thank that nonsense. You. But like, you know, like for, for me, like, you know, I'm talking, I'm thinking about the people who work there and need to feed their families who have visions of their own and don't have the material means by which to construct their own, you know, personhood, agency, national identity, cultural, um, uh, material culture. Uh, and so I think, um, if you, if every black and brown subject in architecture school, faculty or student, thinks of themselves as a trapped colonial subject who is somehow hemmed in by the settler colonial narrative of the United States, it's going to be really hard to rely upon the architecture school as your only form of agency. You need to be keyed into black movements, cultural movements. You need to to feed off of the life that they're producing and your work needs to be explicitly related to those revolutionary efforts. If you don't have that, you are rudderless and afloat and you're, you're, you know, you're at the mercy of wherever the winds of change are moving. Sometimes if you're in the right place and the right time, you might be all right. But if not, you could be off in the middle of the ocean all by yourself. Um, and I think that lends itself to the sense of isolation that black architects feel that it's that they're they're existentially registering the fact that they are made to be isolated in this space and that institutionally they cannot rely upon architecture to do all the work so i'm i'm encouraging them to and i'm this is just one right one tether towards like post colonial studies and literature with the settler colonial lens you guys are encouraging them to put another one to Black Lives Matter movements. There probably should be a hundred of them, right? And so that way you feel anchored. You know, like you know where you come from, what your community wants, what kind of material culture is gonna support that space. And that reference, that world of reference, that horizon should be the spaces that you're beholden to, not to European diasporic discourses, not to the whiteness of your architectural academy. And if an institution wants to support that, like really support that, tenure people who say this, who say to the face of white liberals, you are institutionally racist and I cannot produce the architecture I need to produce with your literatures, with your knowledge base, with your disciplinary structures. I need to make my own. And if you wanna help me pay for the sustaining of intellectual knowledge that helps us to articulate what that is without reference to you and your settler colonial spaces. That's when we're gonna be in a place where we need to be. Until then, we need a bunch of surreptitious folks in there making those connections and double speaking to folks so that like they feel satisfied and they're okay because they're not racist white liberals, but you're also helping to advance the cause of black nationalism in its various guises. Uh, and, and like, you know, I don't know if like, <laughs> this is because like, I feel myself moving toward tenure and I can say these things. I don't know if it's because like, um, uh, this, is, this is like the veil needs to come off of some folks who really wanna participate and help, but they really just don't know what to do because they're so beholden to these discourses of American exceptionalism and, and good white people. And, and uh, you know, America is this, this purveyor of freedom as opposed to it being a settler colonial space that pervades racism and whitewashes it with a kind of narrative of inclusion and pluralism. Um, but I think that like, we need to be able to speak plainly so that institutionally we can say, this is what I need. Like I need this much money. 
this many tenured professors, this many licensed architects, this many entrepreneurs, this many black families before this becomes a real thing. If not, we're just talking about a fantastic category that makes you feel better and dehumanizes you. And, and I think that like that just needs to be plain. That needs to be plain for people so that they don't make, you know, what a really silly studio, you know, projects of we're going to go and we're going to make this black community better. We're going to improve it when you're really going to gentrify it, right? Like not understanding the mechanisms of power that are at work uh, in, in this in this way. And so, you know, I, I, I think that architecture schools can play a role, but I think that the only way they're going to play a major role is if they create a horizontal framework for who is the architect and what creative genius is. That is a major critique of the Eurocentric discourse that they've inherited about monumentalism that continues to privilege those with networks of power. I mean, David Ajay was the, the, the son of, um, of ambassadors, right? Like he wasn't just a regular folk who came from school and became upper middle class. Like, you know, those things are still there. And so I think that like, um, I don't know, I, I feel like for some people, we just need to speak plainly. <laughs> and so in the plain language, I would say that every black subject in America, in an architecture school, faculty or student, is a captive colonial subject, whether they know it and want to acknowledge it or not. And that everyone is made complicit to that project until you explicitly say, I don't want to do this anymore. I need to imagine a different future. Um, and this, I think that's even beyond like utopian thinking. I think it's like, it's a parallel governance structure that we're looking for. And, but that can be real. I mean, like the United States wasn't real until they decided to go to war and to, to establish itself as separate. So how can we imagine that future for indigenous subjects, for black subjects, for Latinx subjects, for, you know, Asian, Asian American subjects uh, in the United States. But I think that, you know, uh, if, if Black Lives Matter is any indication, I'm glad that they got the nod from the Nobel uh, Prize Committee. We are going to be forced to make this decision. <laughs> you know, like our demographics and, and who is being influenced and affected by it, it's going to force this conversation. So better to be prepared and ahead of the curve as opposed to reacting to it, I think. So clear. And I appreciate this plain speak. Um, there's some questions from students and also I wanna open it up here. Um, I'm gonna read a question, uh, Chico Fazzo, um, she's, she writes, um, uh, and you've gotten a lot in the, in the Vimeo, plenty of thank you, thank you, thank yous. Um, and uh, I first would like to express my gratitude for touching on the often overlooked heterogeneity of blackness in America. I'm aware that this is often is done in as much um, and is a much needed unifying effort. CIRC is a largely international institution. And so what do you think the role of, in the, of the international, i.e. recent immigrated um, black population is in an activism for issues that affect the overall um, American black community, um, uh, affect the overall American black community. I imagine that there is a potency in the international nature of our little um, black arcs student community. In what ways do you imagine this characteristic could be instrumental? I think it's a really good question. Um, I think that um, uh, in some ways, African-Americans who have historical ties to slavery and African-Americans who come in as immigrants, that uh, because of the black white narrative in the United States, uh, we're valued for different things. And so we're artificially uh, made to be opposed to one another. But I think that actually having the two groups sit down and converse with one another about what it is that they share, uh, not in terms of building a, a, a kind of like consolidated hegemonic black culture in the US, because I think that people who come from outside of the US are coming from spaces where they're continuing freedom struggles uh, all on their own. And they bring in a kind of social and political expertise that is parallel to and perhaps even useful to the African-American subject in the United States. So I think if we can speak about like the ways that both of those types of subjects are building freedoms for their communities, instead of trying to force them to be one community in the United States, but to recognize that difference and to speak across that difference in intelligent ways, then I think uh, n you know, no, neither group feels like they are uh, made to be less than, but they actually can come as a full person into that space. Um, and I think that there will be hybridized communities that could emerge from that, but I think you only get that by 
viewing each other as having equal expertise and equal expertise in the kind of freedom struggles uh, that, are, that exist. I'm looking to see if there's other questions in the chat. And also want to open it up. We also have some students here in this forum if they want to ask questions. Um, if not, I can keep stepping with the questions. I have uh, many, but I really would love to open up the floor. Hi, Charles. Uh, my name is Emma. Thank you for being here. Um, I am not an architect, but I'm in the school for the Edge Program for Fiction Entertainment. And uh, I have a question specifically about Afrofuturism and how you see that being implemented into the Black culture as well as um, architecture in general. I'm curious. I've heard um, some of my Black professors saying that they have some disagreements with the concept of Afrofuturism, and I was curious what your thoughts were on that as well. So um, uh, I think it's a good question. I think um, in order to really understand what Afrofuturism is, you may also need to understand what African futurism is. And um, lately they've been developed as distinct categories. So Afrofuturism tends to be related to the needs and desires of African, the African diaspora within the US who are legacy or uh, have experienced slavery at some point in their life. Uh, versus African futurism, which has to do with um, the kinds of futures that are imagined by people who live in Africa. They don't have a relationship to the United States in that way, or when they migrate over, they feel kinship to their home territories and the kinds of futures that they want to help to open up there, as opposed to thinking through the lens of American slavery and trying to move through the settler colonial space. Um, and I think for me, for me personally, I think it's really healthy to develop a vocabulary for those differences, because then it helps us to understand that blackness is diverse and the, the kinds of diverse futures that exist are really uh, important. Important. So like Afrofuturism grew out of this moment uh, in the post-war period. Um, I mean, some people dated to the 90s and, and forward, but there, there are tendencies even before that. Like if you, were, if you loved science fiction at all, you realize that blackness was a problem for many people. They wanted to write it out, that uh, these cultural differences that made us uh, pluralistic in the present seem to be a problem. So if you think about like even a banal example like the um, the Federation in Star Trek. Like everybody seems to be this this walking UN of, of unity and perfection. And like they all serve the Federation, they all follow the, the prime directive. You know, Jordi LaForge was this person who's like, you know, probably born a genius and was an engineer who went right into the Starfleet Academy. Um, but his blackness was something that people couldn't really talk about in a way that was substantive. And, and so Afrofuturists were saying, you know, they just wanted to say that there are black people in the future. They are black. <laughs> they have cultural legacies and that this doesn't make them less fitting for a kind of technological future. It actually makes them more fitting because they create a specific sense of self. And so I think that it was, it was something that was about a kind of U.S. cultural imaginary that was thinking of itself during its, the height of its, you know, international powers, projecting this onto the scientific world and thinking about the assimilated subject that they would produce through the perfection of their liberalism and technology and democracy. And to me, Afrofuturism is really invested in critiquing that, but that isn't the solution to the future. That you know, embracing people's, the, the particular ways that they build modernities in the present is a real way to understanding what their futures will be. Um, and the, the little discussion I've heard about African futurism is really quite interesting because different, territories in Africa have different histories. Uh, some have deeper colonial histories, uh, some have neo-colonial influences on the present, others um, come from wealthier spaces or feel a deeper investment with longer cultural traditions like um, uh, the Kube art tradition or the Yoruban artistic tradition that is celebrated around the world and museums for um, bringing genius to this long story of you know, what is artistic genius? And so the, the African futures then, um, some of them deal with colonialism, but it's not US colonialism in the same way. It's a kind of post-colonial moment. Uh, and what is, what is the potential of the black subject as they look uh, into the future? And others are much more about sort of, um, uh, in, in some ways what we might think of as just like deep political critiques of their moment. Like they're using African futures in the talk about contemporary politics 
in a way that an American reader like myself just would not understand, right? Like all the references would go over my head and I wouldn't know what they were talking about, but it's a really productive venue for them to, to produce that kind of critique. And so I think having those, all of them are, are really useful. And I think at least for myself as a kind of American subject, it, it requires me to be more global, like much more um, generous and, um, and, and exploring the, the knowledge that I don't have and understanding Africa, not just through my own cultural lens, but through the kinds of lenses that they might produce themselves. And in that, in that sense, you know, um, being you know concomitant subject of American imperialism and American empire, I'm just as foreign as some other folks, right? So, so in that sense, it requires even greater effort on our part within the American Academy to be making space for that that kind of work. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. That's a great question. Um, any other questions here in this forum? I think we also have one in the chat. Um, oh, go ahead, John. Uh, uh, sure, I'll just say a quick thing. Um, thank you so much, Charles, for um, all, the, all the kind of questions you raised. I just wanted to um, pick up on a kind of word that you that you used a few times, which is diaspora. And I kind of I think it's a really important word to just kind of emphasize and, and underscore. And I I came kind of into this space as um, uh, like a, um, a British subject also via um, the history of art as, as a disciplinary formation, which has is kind of configured slightly differently and has its own history of um, of kind of confronting and engaging some of the um, some of the thinkers that you that you've brought in and. I mean, I, I, I came at um, the, the conceptualization of diaspora through Stuart Hall, especially. Mm. And, you know, you know, because this idea of the diaspora is also positioned in relation to the nation or the state as a, um, as a kind of projective location or condition for, um, uh, for a people. And, you know, in, in Stuart Hall's thinking, there's this interesting tension between the idea of a kind of black nationalist project, which realizes itself through a state. And he kind of reads this from Fanon, Fanon's idea of the post-colonial state being a free black state, but it was definitely a state, it was a nation state, and it had an essence and a national spirit and its art and its architecture and its ritual and its song and its traditions, all of those things would be there to kind of in, enshrine and maintain um, and, and the essence of that people. And Hall remarks that this kind of nationalist formation was so powerful at that moment at that moment of global decolonization, because it provided a collectivizing force that ameliorated the fragmentation of violent colonial histories. And it was, it was kind of necessary to um, collectivize um, people to um, bring down the end of uh, co colonialism. But then Stuart Hall positions that sense of identity and sameness as a political power to um, a kind of a, a post-colonial politics of cultural difference. And this sense that in fact, one's identity is a matter of becoming rather than being, and a matter of positioning and repositioning oneself continually within a shifting ground and terrain and network of, um, of global connectivity. And, um, and so that kind of a sense of cultural identity as a, a, as a manifestation of becoming also emanates a different sense of a kind of space, a black Atlantic or a circumatlantic um, uh, arena of diasporic interconnectivity. And so I just, it just struck me what you were saying, this kind of tension between on the one hand, a project, a diasporic project, and on the other hand, a kind of um, uh, a nationalist project. And I just wondered if you might say a bit more about those two kind of poles. So uh, I'll try and talk about it from the perspective of um, what is colloquially being called Black America, which seems to guide a lot of the Black architects from this post-war generation, post-1945 generation, um, who are very invested in the HBCU project. They see it as a cultural project that is shared by Black Americans. Um, and um, for, for that generation, um, I think the way that the term diaspora functions was more of a kind of like um, an historical fact that they needed to 
deal with, that, that uh, their legacy in being in the United States was uh, of historically connected to Africa, but broken purposefully in order to make their population manageable. And that made their job then the construction of a kind of black consciousness, a state of mind that identified them as a nation. And within that form of black consciousness, I knew where the capital of black America was. It was in Harlem, right? I mean, today we might argue maybe it's in Atlanta, right? But there are places where I can say that that kind of blackness thrives and continues, um, but it is boundless in terms of its geography. It, it, it is where the people are. Uh, and in that sense, I think um, what I find interesting about black America in the US is its statelessness, right? Like it's not sort of, looking for the establishment of an Israeli state or something like that, it's looking for the establishment of culture that would identify its state of mind. And that that's what makes it so useful. I think that's why it travels so well. I think that's why its subjects are welcomed around the world because they identify themselves against national boundaries. In that sense, you know, they're very much like what Du Bois imagined the black subject to be, which is the ultimate modernist, the ultimate global subject because they've been forced to create nation without land. Uh, but this notion of land, I think, is, is important because, um, I mean, like for, in some narratives of 40 acres and a mule would you know, give black Americans a certain amount of land for building wealth. But then that makes them a permanent part of the subject of dispossessing native land, right? And so um, understanding where blackness is, uh, if, if we only understand the state of mind, we, we elide that problem. Right. What is the concomitance of black America in maintaining this white project? Um, and so it, to me, it only makes sense in the historical sense of a story yet to be completed. I don't know where black America's land is going to be because it's still America. I don't know where native land will be because it's still America. And because of that, we're forced to be a state of mind. Um, and some of our subjects have left home and returned back to the diaspora roots from where they came from or other places and made other roots. But I think that that question, at least raising that question, forces the question of, you know, what is America but a settler colony? And how else can Black Americans identify themselves except as stateless within this kind of, of mix? Because as soon as they start taking land, I think they become the settler. And I think that that becomes a kind of moral compromise. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to think that this is an exceptional thing. I'm sure that this has been reproduced in other places where there's been a, a, a settler colony and then people are forced to choose sides. But I do think that like, at least in this phase of development, there probably are global lessons to be learned there. Um, and you'll have some who are like, here's my flag, that's my house, right? Like, <laughs> this is where the nation is. And then you'll have some that's like, it's a state of mind and we need to be these kind of uh, global purveyors of this sense of globality. Um, and I think, but I think we need both of them to decide, to see which one is more productive. Um, and so I, I don't want to be presumptuous and say one is better than the other or one is more moral than the other, but that at least within the structural condition, you know, that experiment, if undertaken rigorously, could be really quite rich and, and interesting. So that's a great question. Thank you for that. Charles, I think that this conversation could go for a really long time. Um, I know, I see we're the gonna, timer. We're going to have a time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm I don't know. Do you know Brian? Brian, you and Charles know each other? I, I know of him, yes. Oh, uh, Brian. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for being here. Space with you. This is wonderful. Charles, uh, before you, I hope that you can stick around for as long as you can, but also jump off when you need to jump off. Uh, quick question. Have you been uh, watching Steve McQueen's Small Acts? I have not. I, I, it's on run, my list, but I haven't. Run, don't walk. When you get off this, <laughs> turn, when you light your fire tonight, watch him because so I, I'm, I, I have, I want to, there'll be the second conversation to follow up um, okay. on the question of kind of beginning to um, relate, thread some of these kind of um, histories of protest um, across the globe um, and, okay. and, and the craft of being able to tell that and how that, how that, how that can start to transmit. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you all very much. And I'll definitely look into that. That's that's something on my list. So yes. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to do my duty here and I'm going to shift gears. 
I don't know how I kind of need to shake it out, but because we are um, literally going to be shifting gears, but welcome, Brian. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to do an introduction. Okay. And, um, and uh, let me just get my marbles together here. Um, I, uh, I'm going to start off a little, a little standard here, which is Brian, Brian, um, Brian, Brian Lee Jr. He lives, you live in, in, and work in New Orleans. Yes. Um, he has the design, he's a design principal of Colocate, um, a national design justice, and he's a national design justice advocate. Um, Lee has 12 years of experience in the field of architecture. Lee is a founding organizer of design justice platform and organized the design as protest national day of action. Um, Brian has led two award-winning architecture and design programs for high school students through the Arts Council of New Orleans and National Organization of Minority Architects. I can say that I have had the distinct honor of getting to know Brian um, this year um, uh, through the far-reaching platforms that he has established. Um, I was in the core group of the develop, of developing DMU, the um, Dark Matter University, which emerged from uh, Design as Protest, um, Brian's project. We call it DAP. Um, uh, Brian's work is manifold and it touches many. Uh, the core values, which I'm sure uh, will emerge today as he presents and as we talk, are based in architecture, um, an architecture of social justice. Um, Brian, I, I think we were all eager to learn from you today. Welcome. Um, and I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, this is a uh, an, an honor to be in this space with you uh, and everybody else who's had the the, the opportunity to uh, to speak today. I'd also say just thanks to the students who are organizing. As someone who started as a student organizer, uh, I won't give my age, but um, it doesn't matter. Back in in the early two thousands, uh, I think. It, it takes a lot to, to step out of one's lane that is, is being projected upon you by your university and to um, and to, to, to forward movement work like this. So uh, it is much appreciated. I'm going to be brief about the total comments and then we'll have a, a broader conversation about the work itself. Um, so uh, is it cool if I if I share uh, a screen? Yes, that, please right? do. Please okay. do. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, so I'm going to. We're going to talk a little bit about design justice, but what, what I'm going to just kind of brief you all, I'm going to switch to my phone here in a minute after I give this presentation so I can go to the hospital. Cool? Cool. Um, so just, just briefly again, we are centered on design justice as a form of practice, but it is really a way for us to consider the, the kind of legacies of power in place. And that work in itself um, stems, at least our work stems from uh, from that notion in its in its totality. And so we're constantly thinking about the sophisticatedly informal use of formal architectural precedent of a place. So that's that's where you get the term co-location. Uh, we are often thinking more broadly or more specifically about the sequence of people in place habitually juxtaposed with one another uh, at a greater frequency than chance. I uh, just listening to the the tail end of, of, of Charles speak. He, he mentioned um, uh, the, the kind of condition of blackness in relationship to the land. And I wanted to just kind of tie into that just uh, just briefly in that, you know, one of the most the, the, the kind of historic condition of blackness is one in which land is either is being extracted from. Right. Um, and so uh, that idea of placelessness, that idea that um, being uprooted and and uh, Kind of uh, displaced is a perpetual condition of of, of the, the total story of blackness, and so where we find the relationships of people in place is even more necessary uh, than than uh, than others. So, to think about this more 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 specifically. Uh, we are actively considering power, and and I often pull this relationship to to Malcolm X and the the, um, the speech to the grassroots, which talks about the history of all revolutions is based in blood and land. It is the landless versus the landlord, and that in itself is speaking about the pursuit of independence without love loss, without uh, negotiation. Uh, it is about. Uh, it's about being willing to sacrifice, but it is fundamentally about being sac sac sacrificing in relationship to land and ultimately what happens with that land. Um, our values, our values are that um, what we build is, is validated through the spaces and places uh, we design. Our collective values are validated through the spaces and places we design. 
And so to, to add on top of that, in racist systems, we are creating monuments to the hubris of white supremacy through the built environment. And so if we are not careful, um, uh, and, and so often we have not been, um, we establish an entire scaffold um, with, uh, across the landscape that, that su supports and sustains uh, white supremacy in its, by its very nature. And lastly, care, right? It's not enough to, to uh, simply understand that values exist within physical space. You actually have to go a step further and uh, exude care within uh, that space. So design justice is what love looks like uh, in public spaces. This script from Dr. Cornell West. So uh, in saying this and at least uh, anchoring it, we're talking about that for nearly every injustice in this world, there is an architecture, a plan that sustains that injustice. Design justice simply calls on us to forward a radical anti-racist vision for racial, social, and cultural reparation through the process and outcomes of design. I say radical because it is about getting to the root of a particular issue. I say reparation because we must repair in order to move forward. I say process and outcomes because it's not enough just to see uh, a beautiful building at the end result. It actually has to serve and be in, it has to, ha it has to value the communities it serves and it has to care about those outcomes, not just as it stands, but in perpetuity. Um, and then also, the act of seeking justice through design, uh, which is a, a difficult proposition um, to bear in the first place, but the act of seeking justice through design requires us to challenge the privilege and power structures that use architecture and design as a tool of oppression. So anything that we see, most, most issues we see in our uh, environment have some linkage or some scaffolding that is supported through the architecture, whether that's uh, climate justice, uh, whether that's housing, transportation, economic justice, they're all rooted in some form of, of structural uh, consideration. And so um, when we talk about this work, uh, specifically through DAP, specifically through DMU, we are actively seeking to challenge that through a series of demands that call on us to reimagine uh, particular notions uh, of, of blackness or um, of, of disinherited communities more broadly. Uh, so we're thinking about divesting from police and investing in communities, uh, which we've seen recently uh, over the last six or seven months, people attempting to shift uh, the narrative relative to that, ending the carceral state more broadly, uh, challenging defensible space and septed tactics, enhancing self-determination, uh, preserving and investing in black cultural spaces, the narratives and stories that are told about space need to be held within those spaces, redefining what a just neighborhood or just cities look like, shifting democratic and public policies for public space, reimagining the financial structures, the, the structures and, and binds that, that tie us to uh, our work specifically, and then also reimagining again what, uh, I think what we're talking about here, again, reimagining what it looks like uh, to think about design education. Uh, and so in order to do that, in order to do that work, there's a couple just conflated definitions that I want to kind of ground us in before we move uh, on this work. Uh, I often talk about the difference between outreach, engagement, and organizing. I try to try to be brief about this, but clearly when we talk about outreach uh, being conflated with organizing, they are wildly different things. And so Outreach is a communication strategy. Engagement uh, provides a feedback loop with that in, uh, with that communication strategy. But organizing, organizing is built to build uh, power, shift political will within communities. And so our job is to recognize the difference between those and how uh, systems uh, are applied with particular sets of pressures, right? And so these are another set of words that are often um, conflated, right? Protest. Uh, rebellion, riot, insurrection. Uh, we're we're now uh, obviously really familiar with the with the insurrection, but insurrections are just uh, power challenging power. It is one trying to usurp um, uh, the other. Uh, riot is a legal and political classification. It is a term used uh, in 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 the kind of politics of of protest to invalidate. Um, and so it is power describing protests or power describing the people. Um, Rebellion is people challenging power. Yes, sometimes that is violent and sometimes that is a, a, a manner in which uh, uh, 
public voice is, is actually heard. But again, most of what we see uh, is, is a form of protest. And protest, what we talk about design as protest is to chat, is to protest is to have an unyielding faith in the power and potential of a just society. It is fundamentally about our collective hope. Um, and I think that in itself is, is described through a unified voice. Now, there is, uh, there is a, a way that the acute uh, condition of protests challenge power in one way, but design as a form of protest has a longer timeline. Um, but it still has the ability to challenge in the same fashions. And so that's the, the, the space that I encourage people to, to stay within. Um, part of this then re re realizes that we have to recognize the difference between neighborhoods and communities. Um, neighborhoods are the geographic boundaries, the physical components of space, but communities themselves. And the thing that we actually have to start to build on and build with uh, is the, the kind of spiritual, cultural, social uh, relationships that have an affinity to space, but are not necessarily bound to that space. It is why we can be displaced, but it is, it is to the point that, that again, Charles made uh, briefly, that placelessness allows a uh, kind of a, a, un a universality around its cultural means. And so, Reminder, reminding ourselves that there is no such thing as community. We are all a part of multiple communities. We are a palimpsest of, of various communities, but there are often inherent or primary uh, communities that uh, that are formed and blackness and, uh, and brownness is, is certainly one of those. So in that work, we have to then recognize that uh, systems require systems uh, to, to, to challenge them. Uh, but if we don't clearly understand what systems are, then we can never really defeat them. We keep uh, in the same cycles over and over again. And in large part, that's because uh, our work um, doesn't, doesn't provide us the opportunity to, to uh, assess and analyze systems in, in real ways. Um, I often get the question when we're doing community uh, engagement work uh, around gentrification, and that is like the core of what most uh, engagement actually faces is, is this notion that we don't want to be displaced. We don't want uh, gentrification to happen within a particular place. And this idea that gentrification in itself, the process of dying scaled up from the human body to the neighborhood. Right. It requires us to understand that the, uh, the link between the issues at the scale of neighborhood are resolved in the human. And if we don't understand systems, we don't know how those things are applied. We don't understand that the pedagogy, the things that we are taught, uh, give reference to the policies that we put in place and the way that those things are codified. Uh, the way things are codified uh, determines how we uh, implement those strategies. And then on the other side, the receivers, uh, we all receive these signals from the things that we've been taught, the things that we are told, the instruction set, uh, so to speak. Uh, but in turn, we then have to uh, challenge ourselves through practice, projects, and people uh, to, uh, to dismantle systems that maintain uh, oppressive, oppressive outcomes. And so again, the design profession is like all institutions, it is a seat of power and privilege. Uh, and if we're not careful, we become conduits to power in a way uh, that is, is harmful uh, to all parties. So um, I'm just gonna do a, a quick little run here because I think as we talk about this work, um, I see protopian uh, kind of avenues of, of our work that rely on culture as a, as, a, uh, as a way to manifest form, as a way to manifest um, uh, uh, the, the architectural expression that, that is so often lost in the, the, uh, the want to create a, uh, a black architecture that is purely that is purely formal and it's not rooted in, 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 in uh, anything, anything particular outside of aesthetic. And so I often ask people from the, from the jump, before we get to the kind of cultural component, what are we afraid of? We're afraid of uh, so many things in this work, but we're also afraid, specifically white people in, uh, in, in, in the context of this work, are afraid that, uh, to relieve power, right? To be relieved of power, to be relieved of privilege. Now, I will, I will give you a, a tad bit of, of privilege or I will give you a tad bit of power, but as long as I don't actually have to lose anything. And so 
uh, we all know that that we're in this work to move past this idea that we can be non-racist. It's it's uh, it requires us to move towards an anti-racism, and our obligation to each other is to actively acknowledge where those biases exist. And so we have to be precise about that in our work in order to dismantle it. It means we have to actually understand what racism is. There is a um, we talk about supremacy versus mutualism in this work often, and supremacy is singularity, and mutualism is plurality. Um, supremacy is entropy. Uh, mutualism is coalescence. Uh, supremacy is like proclamation. It is declarative. Uh, mutualism is narrative. Right. At its at its fundamental core, supremacy is 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 fission, and mutualism is fusion. It is the binding of, of particles to create a mass that is three times stronger than the separating mass of or the separating force of 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 fission. It means that we have to understand uh, that. Uh, individuals, this this idea that one can exist only as as the singular and the system uh, never takes on any heat is, is how we've operated in this country. So we can pinpoint racism or racists. We have a hard time identifying where racism exists within it, within a broader system. Right. And those systems rely on us to have an unconscious bias um, that uh, of the operator to sustain it uh, without catching uh, with, without catching that 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 uh, larger frame, and so again, the racism that exists within our system is also uh, kind of multi-formatted, right? It is it is uh, again uh, intersectional uh, in its oppressive uh, forces as as much as it is a identifier of our communities, right? So those forces applied to communities shape how we interact and navigate our habits, our tendencies and patterns and routines in particular places. And so our ethnoculture, our racialized cultures, our culture in general is a byproduct of the patterns and reactions that we have uh, in place. It's a byproduct of the prevailing environmental, social and cultural forces that exist. So we always talk about culture as the consequence of persistent circumstance and immediate condition. Culture is a collective coping mechanism, and culture is a necessary trauma response. So in this work, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of frame these last few things and then we'll, we'll, we'll switch off, but um, what we're looking at is to move from status quo uh, within practice uh, and in protest to a form of liberation. What we want to be careful of is creating systems that uh, create an activist industrial complex. We want to be uh, uh, careful of creating systems that only provide enough uh, movement and never seek to actually challenge the, the systems themselves, but but only uh, to give us a enough to push back against again. Right? And so we're moving from the idea that injustice really uh, is, is an imbalanced system that denies equal distribution of resources to the other end of the spectrum that requires us to repair. So justice requires us to repair for injustice. Uh, it means make stable and make fair in the present to remove barriers to progress in the future. And liberation asks us to take it one step further and to affirmatively influence future outcomes. It asks us to um, to seek freedom uh, through through the means, the process, and outcomes of our work in relationship to other forms of of, of justice uh, uh, work. Right. So it's not simply about um, there's no architecture that's going to solve any one of these issues. There's no there's no there's no law that's going to solve any one of these issues. There's no public health strategy that's going to solve any one of these issues. It requires us all to be moving towards liberation uh, through the forces that we can apply uh, in our own work. And so lastly, I want to just kind of leave us with the kind of core questions that we ask ourselves on a consistent basis. And that really is, what are the power structures that directly impact our community? Whatever community it is we're, we're working within, uh, what are the injustices that are a result of that power structure? Um, who does, uh, who is directly and disproportionately impacted? How does the built environment manifest or perpetuate that level of injustice? And then lastly, uh, what are the opportunities to reimagine or imagine new systems and models that serve liberation, that, that serve to seek freedom uh, by their very nature? So I want to thank you for, for giving me a time and moment. Let's have a little bit of a conversation about, uh, about this work. Uh, and, and yeah, let's, let's, let's talk. Thank you, Brian. And do feel free to step out when you need to step out. It's yeah. totally fine. I think we all want um, you to take care of yourself. Um, 
Uh, you know, there's, I'm going to start with a couple questions, but I really do think it should be open, particularly for students, um, anybody here. Um, I, I guess I, I, I would imagine one, one pretty big question is, can, if, if you could, uh, can you talk about a little bit about your path towards this work? Because it does seem, it's so particular and, um, and so locked in and so honed in. And I wonder whether or not you could talk a little bit about lineage um, and, 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 and your, and your, yeah, your, your, your trajectory in this. To your original question about, uh, how I got into this work, my, uh, like I said, my parents, uh, were, uh, first, first generation, uh, kind of college students. They got, uh, into the, the, to a master pro master's programs. And one of the things that, that we had in our house consistently were black liberation books. And, uh, part of that was, uh, me, uh, reading uh, a book called uh, the Encyclopedia of Black Excellence, and um, and so I, I I learned from a very early age to to bind uh, the art that I was interested in with uh, stories and narratives of Black liberation uh, from a from an early stage. But I will say that 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 wasn't uh, the the only thing that defined it. I think in large part my my path was was really defined by um, a grandmother that was uh, sick and in a in a house that was continuing continuing to harm her and I, and I think finding the humanity in in the relationship between architecture and people tended uh, served as a as a as a, um, a, a propulsion mechanism for for me uh, and so I, I think that was really what, what what drove me and and by the time I got to college um, you know I went to famU to to, to start um, Rattlers Three Strikes, and I, and we ended up having, you know, a a wonderful bastion of blackness that that served to define what it meant to be black in architecture, but not necessarily to understand blackness as a form of architectural expression. Um, and then as I went off into grad school and went off into to other schools, I I started to run uh, Noma, uh, my Noma student chapter, and that allowed me to think about this work through the lens of, of uh, a formal uh, formal architecture that spoke to the colloquialism um, uh, through a design justice lens. So uh, I think it was a long path, but a lot of the work happened be because uh, there was a care for a particular community member that expanded, um, so well, sorry, for a particular family member that expanded to a broader community. There was a uh, incessance upon learning uh, how how formal uh, architecture is steeped in oppressive uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, determining factors or variables, and and uh, and then also wanting to teach. Once we got to a platform, or once I once I got to um, uh, to uh, once I got after my my um, my time in grad school, I. Uh, joined uh, political campaigns and started to to uh, to do work in that realm. I, I joined other organizations that were organizing on the ground and learned uh, in that capacity. So I, I I took that learning and wanted to actually translate that into uh, kind of youth education. And so we created a, a, a program called Project Pipeline uh, that expanded the the footprint of an organization uh, uh, within within uh, of a program within the national organization of minority, minority architects and that became uh, a a way for us to to talk about this this work um beyond our uh kind of acad our core academic setting uh within university settings so that's a, in brief the, the the kind of trajectory that i was on anybody here want to chip in with a question i have one other but if only wants us to jump in please do um, I have a question. Um, I was in Gordon Kipping's a stu vertical studio in the fall, and it was titled Architecture of Activism. And uh, each student kind of just chose different organizations that they wanted to create um, a piece of architecture for. And a lot of us were like using protest um, architecture as examples. And I'm just kind of you brought that up that protest is a big part of architecture um, in the way that you design. And I'm just curious if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, well, I think the 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 notion that protest is a is a substantial part of our design work is 
is to acknowledge that movements have always been a kind of a, a speculative endeavor, right? They're, they're, they're almost entirely about uh, projecting a future that does not exist. And so when we think about uh, architecture manifesting the demands of movement work, uh, it does allow us that, 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 um, that kind of grounding, right? So when I think about uh, the abolition of, of prisons, well, there's an architectural manifestation that responds to uh, not having prisons in, in the built environment. There is a architectural response that, that, that wants to uh, be expressed through the idea that uh, house, of, of housing for all and, and health care for all and uh, defunding the police. There are all of these, all of these demands that have been um, uh, expressed over time that, that tend to have a architectural expression. And so when we think about uh, design as a form of protest, it is in direct response to a history and narrative of, of um, organizations over the last 150 years who, who have laid a clear path towards what we, um, what we should be looking for in the results of our architecture even if it's just a granular step towards an end result. The floor is open. Well, uh, Brian, it seems like you're, uh, one of the things I hear, which is really powerful, is a sort of um, in uh, and the way in which you have enacted uh, kind of establishing um, your own lineage for what architecture is in order to in order to push forward what architecture will be could become, um, and I'm wondering whether or not you could dispel a little bit of a myth here. So, um, why do you think there has been such a historical fissure between the socially engaged architecture and the formalist project? Do you see that breaking down? Tell us what you think formalists really don't understand about the work of design justice. Um, I mean, I think. <laughs> you're on you're, you're on Sciaric Live. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, so the the kind of uh, distance between a socially engaged, and I think there's actually a distance between forms of socially engaged architecture and and uh, and designers' protests as well, right? I think I think to to start with with the nuance between those is often the same nuance that we see in, in uh, a kind of reformist versus is uh, reverse abolitionist uh, considerations, right? It's one in which uh, we are attempting to, to mend a, a broken system versus uh, one that, that completely seeks to dismantle one. So I think there's a fissure there. Uh, and then the, the next stride to a kind of more formalist structure is one that that is rooted in that is rooted in white supremacy, and and if you're rooted in white supremacy, uh, you are fundamentally uh, negating the the kind of history of outcomes that that serve uh, marginalized communities. And so I think there is no, the, the dissonance or the the kind of uh, the fissure is a byproduct of a a a fundamental flaw in in, in uh, kind of formalist architecture. Can you can you just talk quickly about some of the scales of work you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So part of our response to as um, and where that's going to in the future, yeah, where, future forward. Yeah, where it's been, where it's headed forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as we think about uh, our architecture, we we have uh, we started to to map uh, to do a roadmap that's talked about uh, the scale of mandalas, uh, the kind of ephemeral. Um, the immediate and ephemeral or individual and ephemeral small scale things that impact people from the design perspective um, to markers and memorials. Um, and that all of our work is a, is a, a byproduct of a, of, of a need to create community and community spaces. And so I think our work right now works at the scale of, of the poster, uh, which we attempt to wheat paste in, in physical environments and allow that to shape um, narratives in place. So for instance, uh, we, when we did our paper monuments project, we 
um, we established a set of posters that spoke to the 1970 um, uh, attack on the Black Panthers, Black Panther Party here in New Orleans. And we had an individual who was a part of that or who was 11 years old when that happened. And he became a docent, a public docent, right? And so, and so I think the impact of even occupying, occupying, occupying a two-dimensional space in, in public allowed for that conversation to carry itself through. Um, now, on the other end of the spectrum, we are working at the scale of, of traditional architecture, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 square foot buildings that, uh, again, respond to a critical race theory or respond to a design justice uh, prompt uh, through, through RFP form. So, so it does tend to run the entire gambit from uh, traditional architectural form to planning all the way down to uh, the design of uh, objects and elements that, that serve to impact individuals. Floor is open, but it sounds like you might have gotten to where you need to go. I am in the hospital. I got to see y'all later. Peace. All right, y'all. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Any closing thoughts here before we um, we finish off for the day? That was great. Uh, I think I'm just still like, there's so much that Brian does and there's so much to learn from what uh, his initiative is doing that like, I, I think I'm just still taking it all in, especially in reference to um, um, Charles's earlier points. So just an amazing uh, day two. Mm -hmm. An amazing day two. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm surprised that he didn't in that list also just mention the kind of the all the organizing because I think the organizing he's a lot of student organizing he's a lot of um, um, academic organizing um, there's a sort there's a let's say uh, the kind of movements to me has a scale that exceeds any any five fifty thousand square foot building it exceeds that and I think that there's something really to me, really powerful to hold that in one's mind um, as we, if we are to consider this idea of liberation, you know, in the space of architecture and during this time um, through the lens of blackness. Absolutely. Hmm. All right. Um, just closing thoughts about um, tomorrow. We'll be back at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, the highlighted principles will be trans affirming, queer affirming, and empathy. And we have some really amazing guests again. We have filmmaker Elegance Bratton, and we have activist, um, burlesque dancer, um, artist Raven Wangs. Um, we're really excited to have both of them. And then we'll have Lee Paulus and Vincent Young as moderators. So I hope you guys can join us again tomorrow. Um, the live stream link is on the same page. You just click for Wednesday. Um, and thank you, Mira and John and everybody for being here. Just really, really great.